Hello, everybody. Welcome, very warm well, welcome to the Tortoise Newsroom. My name is Liz Mosley. I'm an editor and partner here. It's Friday lunchtime. Some Ooh. people have come to the newsroom. I've got a large box of salted caramel flavour Lindor for those people who wishes to have one. Thank you very much to my colleague Marion. She's purchased them because she's been torturing me with many requests for work all week, and this is the compensation I receive. So I'm going to pass those round. Please do help yourself. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with... Um, George Pritchett, who um, has joined us to talk about this here book, um, My Mess is a Bit of a Life, as part of the Fora Restore programme. And we do get in trouble sometimes, not bad trouble, but slight trouble from um, people in chat on Thinkins for being a bit sycophantic, maybe sometimes not challenging enough when somebody's come in to talk about their book. And I make no apology for the fact that this book has made me laugh out loud and actually you cried Marion I didn't cry <laughs> quite um, but it is so 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 lovely what a lovely thing to have done because Georgia is um, the, the woman who's basically a anything you've ever watched on telly that is funny Georgia wrote it is what you find out when you read her bio <laughs> slightly annoyingly um, uh, but we're going to talk about the book um, which came from a funny place. The title of the thinking today is What's So Funny About Anxiety? And although it's a very funny and heartwarming and, th and thought-provoking and interesting and engaging um, thing to read, um, it came from a very dark place in your life, didn't it, Georgia? Yes. And it, it sort of is therapy itself, the book. Just tell us a bit about the inception of it and why it started. Um, I think, you know, when you're having a difficult time, people often say oh, you should write that, you know, you should write it down, that will help. And to me, that seemed like a terrible idea because mm. I am a writer. So, um, <laughs> you know, if it's like saying to a dentist, do more dentistry, you'll, you'll, be mu you'll feel much better. So I, I thought that was nonsense. Um, and, uh, and then my agent suggested I should sort of write a bit about my life. And I told her in no uncertain terms that... Uh, the one thing we can be sure of in this life is that I would never, ever write a memoir. No, no, indeed. No. And then you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, heads will roll when I find out how this has happened. Yes, I don't quite, I can't really, a terrible lapse in judgment, lockdown madness, I don't know, some desperate yeah. need for human connection meant that, yes, I do appear to have written a memoir. Why would you, why would you be so dead set against doing it? Um, I think, you know, I'm British and middle class and therefore repressed and yeah, emotionally unevolved. Sure. Hands up if you feel, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and as a script writer, I mean, a script writer's perfect, perfect job for a shy person because you get to be at home in your pyjamas and um, you just express yourself through stealth. You know, mm -hmm. you, you write, you literally put words in other people's mouths yeah. and you're completely anonymous. No one cares about who the writers are, and that just suits me perfectly. So to suddenly write something direct is um, terrifying. Do you still feel terrified talking about it now? Yes, I do. And this is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> because, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> because I've written an entire book about how I am not good at talking yeah. about my feelings. I've been yeah. very clear on that. <laughs> And now you've invited me to do exactly that. <laughs> so, did you read it I'm carefully? <laughs> I, I, I read it perhaps a little late. Right. Um, um, we're honest, genuinely grateful to have you here. I can see some people chatting already. I love this woman is one of the first oh. comments that have been made by Mel. Hello, um, Mel. Mel, Mel oh, Didrock, yeah. who is, in fact, let, let's bring Mel in. Hello, Mel, are you there? She's lurking at home and she doesn't think we're going to talk to her. Maybe she's too afraid to come on screen if she's there. Anyway, um, if you can find Mel, that would be brilliant to, to have a chat with her. Um, oh, I can't. I've got COVID. No, no. I'm so sorry. She says you're one of our finest comedy writers ever. She can't come on screen because she's got COVID. Well, get well soon. 
Um, Mel, I'm very I sad, keep sad to hear asking Paul. her to text me a picture of her COVID toe, and she has yet to oh, do that. Oh, a COVID toe. Yes, it's the thing, like chill yeah. brain. It's one of the COVID things that you can get. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're welcome for the medical advice also <laughs> thrown into today's uh, thinking. Um, let's just keep going. If you have got um, questions or thoughts or reflections, if you're serious or silly, whatever, just stick your hand up or, or come in um, the chat. Um, just start us off. Tell us the sad tale of Nelson the Canary. So I've got a question about that. <laughs> well, yes. So uh, I think the only thing in life that I have not been confused about is that I wanted to be a writer. So I, um, even before I could write, I was um, speaking stories in a, into a tape recorder. They were mainly about budgies getting lost and not be able to find their way home. Mm. It's a niche genre. <laughs> it hasn't taken off in the way that Still I time. hoped. Still time. Still time. Um, but then I was so interested in budgies, my parents bought me a budgie called Nelson. Well, uh, named after Nelson's column. Um, mm. And uh, I, I mean, all my pets sort of devoted most of their time to trying to get away from me and indeed Nelson, very happy in the shop, as soon as I got him home, just plunged into a bottomless pit of despair and, <laughs> and just yeah. stood at the bottom of his cage, kind of sighing and staring at the wall. Um, and then one day I came home from school and he was gone. Mm. And my mum, the, the door was open, my mum told me that he'd escaped and flown off and had was probably living with a lady budgie and was very happy somewhere. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and then when I sort of casually mentioned in or passing, or a man budgie, or whatever, whatever, chosen, whatever, we're, any, we're, anything, we're okay with we're it. We're fine with yeah. any, whatever Nelson was into <laughs> was good by me. Um, and yeah, so then when I sort of mentioned to my dad, you know, shame about Nelson, and he was like, "Yeah, I know. It took me ages just with this brick trying to get him to die." <laughs> and, Look at like, Chase Wilson's face. <laughs> I was like, what? I bet the, I thought with happy with the yeah. male lady, or female lady nice, yeah. pansexual budgie. And like, oh yeah, 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 that's right. That, that's yes, that's what's happened. But yes, it turned out that he'd he, it was his version of treating Nelson's depression yes. was to put him out of put his him out of his misery. Mm. Now at the we end have of that, better systems these days. Yes, <laughs> yes still trying. Yes. Um, in the end of that um, chapter, and one of the things that makes the book such a pleasure to read is that it's, all the chapters are really, really short. Yes. So you can kind of zoom through it and get yeah. kind of hit after hit. Uh, and it says that taught me that there's no such thing as happy endings is the end of the sad <laughs> yes. tale. Do you really believe there's no such thing as happy endings still? Or is that just a um, line, really? No, I think I'd... I think what I, what I realised, what I've realised over the years is that life is a better joke writer and drama writer than I could ever be. <laughs> and so there's always a great twist. Life provides you with brilliant jokes, brilliant mm. twists, some great happiness, but there's always some unexpected thing that you could never have thought up however many hours you toiled at your laptop. So, mm. yeah. There's because it's a, it is a really funny book, like I've said, but it, and in it, you're sort of working through w why you'd come to this po point in your life where you just felt terrible and you give funny names to all the weird symptoms of the anxiety that you have. Yes. Just I hesitate to say this, I understand it's a Friday lunchtime thinking, Tell us about the big beaver. What what's that to do with? <laughs> sounds, it isn't Dark as rude beaver. as it sounds, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's the porn version that I yeah, haven't yeah. released yet. Um, I suppose yes. It, um, it's easy uh, to kind of. Oh, I find it easier to kind of think of my various anxiety symptoms in terms of sort of creatures or things that I can mm. feel I can get to know. Um, a bit like Eminem with the monsters under his bed. I mean, I'm very <laughs> like Eminem in so many ways. <laughs> but um, I didn't need to say that, obviously. Um, but yeah, so, I, so in my mind, that, that sort of gnawing feeling you get in your tummy when you're anxious, which is always um, for me, 
uh, I decided was a sort of dark overlord beaver chewing yeah. on my intestines and probably doing evil poos in there because that's, <laughs> I imagine, the sort of thing evil <laughs> overlord beavers do. And then um, <laughs> my younger son's really into Godzilla, so I, um, there's nothing I don't, if anyone wants to ask any questions about Godzilla or his nemesis, Nemesis. Um, I know all that. Uh, but so, yes, I, I sort of had this image of, of an inner Godzilla stomping all over my inner Tokyo, which is sort of when you yeah. have that kind of empty feeling. There, yeah, there's lots of there's moths in my brain. And did you invent that stuff to sort of self therapize yourself or was it is that just part of because you're an imaginative and creative I think person? That's just how it felt. I yeah. thought, what's but yeah, being emotionally unevolved, I thought, what's that weird feeling? <laughs> Probably Godzilla. <laughs> Probably Godzilla, yeah. yes. Yes, exactly. And in the book, as, as you know, it takes me so long to realise that I might be a bit anxious or depressed. I, get, I go to every sort of doctor or homeopath or thinking that it must be some sort of physical problem that I can just fix with a a pill or a tiny crack, what my a homeopath tried to give me, when I mentioned I was scared of spiders, he gave me a pill and it turned out there was a tiny crushed up spider, spider. in there and so yeah. I tried to explain. I don't think that's how you beat fear. Yeah. Like, if I was scared of flying, no, it wouldn't I work if you didn't believe it. You see, you have yeah. to believe it for it to work. That's oh, what they want you to, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And um, I, I, there's lots of there's lots of in this book kind of slightly freakishly that really massively uh, resonates with me personally i also suffer with terrible anxiety have a late onset thyroid problem like you did too um that's a euphemism by the way for those of you that read the book the, the um a, a thing that you talk about particularly when you're describing little georgia when you when you're a kid um it is homesickness and oh, yeah. I'm very interested in homesickness because I have crippling homesickness and it's a really uncool thing yeah. to experience <laughs> especially still now as an adult where I don't want to be away from home I don't like going on holiday yes. I definitely don't like going away with work just t tell us a bit about the homesickness and do you still feel it now yes I do <laughs> it's terrible I just had to go to I mean this sounds ridiculous but I, I was lucky enough to go to New York for the succession launch and was just completely homesick the whole time mm. and you know they had different pillows in the hotel mm. and it was weird yeah and it smells it weird smelled different yeah, yeah. And you don't know how to do a thing that you need to do. That's yeah. my main beef with not being at home. Yes. An ordinary thing like have a cup of tea or yes exactly it's really hard to think about that yes stuff. i know exhausting actually it's yes it's very and you, yeah it's very complicated you get lost you do, yeah yeah horrible yeah and when you for anxious children we did some stats at the beginning um and i'm a parent too and have a couple of kids one of whom is clearly an anxious child the other one i think just mirrors me um <laughs> well done uh, thank you <laughs> thanks thanks um the, the how it feels to be an anxious child versus how it looks from the outside to a grown-up mm, comes yeah. through really strongly and actually some, some of the depictions of prime i could smell the primary school you know all primary schools <laughs> have that smell don't they sort of poster paint and yes. rubber shoes and stuff yeah. and um talk to me a bit about when how old were you when you first probably not a kid i don't know when you first thought perhaps everybody doesn't worry like i worry yeah i think it took me a while um i think that yeah there's a few chapters like when i turn up at nursery so i was three and they're all singing we're going to the zoo and that sent me into complete panic mm. um because i didn't want to go to the zoo and i realized everyone else was looked happy about the situation mm. um, and then as I grew older I realized I I became very concerned that I was going to develop Robertson's giant limb which is a disease where one of your legs goes massive mm. Um, mm. So it can forever. happen at zoos yeah. yeah 
so I was always measuring my legs just to check. Um, and I realised that other people were, were not constantly no. measuring their legs. No. No. <laughs> the fools. No. Um, Doesn't feel like an immediate word. threat to me, myself. But, Doesn't yeah. it? Not, well, not now, I pop, now I popped Perhaps it in I'll your mind. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about being a warrior is you sort of think, oh, I've got everything covered now. Mm. I really have mm. worried because it sort of feels like a bit of an insurance thing that maybe if I worry about it, it won't happen. And I, you sort of think, OK, I've covered everything. And then something crops up that you hadn't thought mm. of. So when I was recently in the States, um, this woman came up to me and said, oh, would you be interested in some anti-aging cream? And I said, yes, I would. And she said, for your vagina. <laughs> and I was like... Tess is oh. interested. <laughs> <laughs> and then your face, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> and that, there's a whole avenue, for want of a better word, of worry <laughs> that I hadn't thought of. And I was just like... Well, I mean, you know, they have to match. It's no, you know. Yeah, yeah it would anything, be weird. It would be In weird. a typical week, more people see my face. <laughs> yeah. So, if anything, I'm more interested in yeah. face yeah. anti-aging. Yeah. So. Oh, dear. I do this funny thing with my worrying, and I have been doing really it since I was where that sentence was going. My worrying, guys, <laughs> relax. Which is, I think about, so there's the thing that I'm worried about, which let's say, I don't know, it's a terrible thinking coming up, I don't know what I'm talking about. That's all, all, that's all the time. And I think what I have to pay, I have to invest the worry up front yes. to protect against exactly. the worst case Insurance scenario. Policy, yes. And it's always the thing that you haven't exactly. invested in that yes. gets you. So you have to be really comprehensive in the worrying, otherwise yes. you're exposed. Yes. I totally agree, and that's why in a month, few months' time you'll read my obituary and I will have died with a combination of Robertson's giant limb and old vagina. With, with vagina. <laughs> Wizened. What a way to go. I know. Oh, my God. And it'll, I'll only have myself to blame because I just didn't put the hours in. I feel like we can all support you in the worrying about the vagina thing. I think we can Thank all you. collectively do some vaginal worrying and we'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I've never said vagina this much in a thing. Neither yeah. have I. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. Um, <laughs> um, but let's stay with staying with body image. <laughs> so this might be a fun game, actually. Um, as a, I don't know if it happens only to women or more to women, but I I, I was once told I look like Martin from EastEnders. <laughs> By a woman I worked with, who, and she did look like Jerry Ramone, but I didn't say that back to her. But you, you were told you looked like Robert Plant. Yes. Nice. Yes. Or, and if I grew a beard, like Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, I've got a very high forehead, which I try and... <laughs> It's the writing thing. It's sort of it's a uh, yes, physical let's manifestation. Let's say that. Mm. Let's go with that, but, yeah. But seriously, though, you, 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 this is all a big factor in your anxiety too which is yes. the sort of sense of yourself and what you look like and all the rest of it yes. and this do you think that's made worse because you've been in and around telly people who are all glamorous and exciting well male writers aren't glamorous at all no. so uh, i think it was because i didn't I don't ever get to work with women i think that makes if mm. you haven't got a sort of barometer to measure yourself against mm. for better or for worse mm. i think that's odd and then um I made this discovery that um, I'm quite short. I'm always the shortest person in the room standing up, but sitting down, mm. I'm the tallest person in the room because I have a very long torso <laughs> and very short legs, the dream. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's quite hard to dress for the long torso. <laughs> Do you, is this something that you generally carry with you? Do you, do you sort of have the a physical appearance? So I'll, I'll tell you the thing. I did a thinking about um, obesity and COVID and things like that a while ago. And 
enjoyed the conversation. It was a good conversation. We made some good points and things. But I didn't realise that I would finish the conversation and feel upset at the right. end of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I really did. Is it, is it, do, you, do you feel upset about it? Or can you just, just go, oh, stuff and nonsense, and that's just part of it? Now? I think two things have happened. One is um, I'm old and I can't, I'm too lazy to care anymore. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and the other is that after being the only woman for 25 years on any show I ever worked on, I finally in America got to work with some other women and and they looked a bit like me, dressed a bit like me, and that was pathetically validating. It was mm. really interesting how much that meant to me and it must be what it's like to be a white man every single minute of mm. every day when you walk into mm. any room or turn on the telly. Because to see yourself reflected back at you is really good for your self-esteem mm, yeah. and suddenly I could see oh I'm, I'm not far off the mark they they look a bit like me that mm. you know I must be doing something okay mm. and I think it must be really there are still so many people who don't see themselves reflected in life or on tv or on screen and that's really hard I think mm. it, I think that makes a massive difference mm, definitely I'm I'm really enjoying the <laughs> the chat where people are discussing the people that they've been told they look like. Okay. <laughs> but, so Patricia Clark, who's a colleague who works here at Tortoise, has been told she looks like Elvis Presley, which I think is harsh. <laughs> if you've ever seen Patricia, who's quite frankly a beautiful young woman, I don't think Elvis Presley is appropriate at all. And, and um, Mark, um, I think, is this you, Mark? Mark St. Andrew, you're typing. Tell us who you've been told you look like. Well, my mother-in-law said I look like Dean Gaffney. <laughs> Me and you, eating these senders. Yeah, so that's the spin-off. And um, last week, the tortoise photographer said I look like Tom Hanks, which I, Ooh, I'm going to nice. take that one. That's nice, that's yeah. nice. And when I was on a holiday, I got rough-looking Ben Affleck. <laughs> Actually, that that's you good. are a bit rough-looking Ben Affleck, yeah. I would say. I think that's yeah. true. Tessa, yeah. who do you get told you look like? Jane Torville. Jane Torville, <laughs> yes. I think that's good. No. Young Jane Torville, so that's a lovely yeah, oh. Jane Torville. Mm. Nice. Kelly McGillis on a good day. <laughs> yes, yeah. true, true. Um, Georgia, would you mind reading out a little bit of the book sure, so people yes. can get a sense of what... The, the, there's lots of big laughs, but I think maybe the biggest laugh was the one on page 161. For me, I just yeah. thought it was right. really spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have to be? There's a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah, yeah, words. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, right. This is called Split Personality. I've often wrestled with the question, who am I? I came round from a procedure at hospital and while high on whatever excellent drugs they give you, I talked at length to the nurse about the racism I had suffered growing up black in the southern <laughs> states of America. <laughs> I told her she had it easy. <laughs> Later, I had to go and find her and apologise. She was black and being told she had had it easy by a white woman must have been more than a little galling. So now I knew who I was, an absolute twat. <laughs> Amazing. I've t in, in my notes, I've entitled that section Identity. There you go. <laughs> a little bit of insight there for you. Yeah. Um, Good, good drugs. It's really yeah. good drugs. Um, there's a, well, as, as you go through this book, I, I said to you yesterday when we had a brief chat before today, that sort of by the time I got to the sort of second half of it, I was almost dreading turning the page because in your that life... That was my aim. I, yes, want, I want to really excellent. deter people That's the brief. from turning the page. <laughs> yeah, great. Because in your life, a, a, a lot of really genuinely awful things have have happened to you and obviously that's part of the working through of the where's this anxiety coming from the constant knowing everything else um but the, in the beginning bit it's like the you, you sort of have this sense of little georgia being anxious child and but you're doing normal stuff that children do like eating tiddlywinks and things like that yes um, and and delicious Round the edge as you get older, sort of around the edges, it's the, it's the nastiness and the cruelty of the world. Yes. It sort of seeps in from the outside. <laughs> yeah. Was that part of... I mean, I don't know if you remembered this stuff chronologically. I don't suppose you did. Yeah, I think when I started thinking back to my childhood, I mean, it's... I read this interesting thing when I was doing it that... Um, I don't know if you 
all heard this, that you only ever remember anything once. And then after that, you remember remembering it. Oh, how weird. So, um, so I wanted to sort of stay true to that, that, those sort of impressionistic memories of a child where you don't really get the full picture. You sort mm. of, things happen and you kind of notice things, but you don't understand it fully. So I, I didn't want to sort of retrospectively give myself any hindsight in those memories. I wanted to sort of tell it as it was. And there is that feeling... You know, I grew up in the 70s, really, was when I was a child, and just the sort of horrifying casual racism and sexism that mm. you become aware of as you sort of go out into the world more and more. And I, so I wanted to kind of be true to that and how that your sort of safe bubble that you have at home sort of gradually gets eroded as, as, the, as the more difficult aspects of life kind of... Um, collide with your life but you weren't aware of it at the time or you were I was aware of it and you just you just think why is that man being horrible to that woman or why yeah. you know you it's it's you don't understand why this is happening yeah. um, and it's disturbing yeah um, and as as in in this sort of process I'm genuinely interested we've talked a lot about mental health recently um in, in taught as various different scenarios quite often it's you know big companies trying to figure out what what they're supposed to do about looking after people and in the pandemic and everything else yeah. um and, and i'm and i'm genuinely interested in whether in the process of sort of putting a shape on some of the factors and the experiences that have you know written mm. down and putting them in an order yeah did that feel helpful as an explanation as to why you worry I think, I don't know if it explained it, but I think it did help. I think, you know, when we're all in the middle of messy, chaotic life, I think we can all give ourselves a really hard time and think, mm. oh, I should be better at work, I should mm. be a better partner or friend or mother or whatever it is. And you're always kind of um, kind of giving yourself a hard time about that. And actually, when you when I kind of came to write it down, I felt a bit of... A tiny, in my cold heart, I felt a tiny shred of compassion <laughs> to my younger selves, sort of thinking, oh, you know, you were doing your best, you know, mm. there were difficult times, you, you know, it's, and I think that was helpful to kind of, to just look at yourself with a bit more compassion and mm. sympathy. Mm. And you would need a lot of that compassion, sympathy, patience, not sympathy quite, but patience, patience definitely is a parent because when we get into the becoming a parent part yeah. that's when the shit really hits the fan in many ways <laughs> does, yes. um and i i wonder whether that experience well i don't know you said so, so becoming a mother we're sort of there's so many versions of it that exist in the world you know you mm. can be the cupcake baking you know you can be the prosecco o'clock you know there's yeah, all there's yeah. ways of doing it yes. um, or you can be me which is just sort of in despair about the whole thing forever <laughs> do, do, do you and you obviously did your family in a particular way and you know fertility treatment all that how do you feel now you've been doing it for 15 years because you're you know you're yeah. into the swing a bit now presumably. Yeah. do you yeah. feel like the mother you've got the motherhood thing no i think how i feel is if i could do it again i would be really good <laughs> like the first two they're like pancakes i've spoiled i've grown those yeah 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 <laughs> they're yeah. Really good. yeah yeah okay but now, give them the children and yes. then number three that's mine <laughs> yes if i did it again now i would be great um but yeah it's a shame mm. um i'm <laughs> i've messed up with those two but uh <laughs> yeah they're, they're, it's too late <laughs> too late, too late Such job done. I, yeah. uh, imi actually who is over here somewhere is, has asked a really good question in the chat which i'd love to know what people think here um, has anyone here mastered how not to be so hard on yourself? <laughs> I can see mm. Steph's like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> so, so it, it, is it, do you think it's a new thing? Do you think we're harder on ourselves now? I think we probably are, but I'm, I'm sure social media has, has made it worse. Contributed towards that, yeah. It makes it look like Was, everyone else. You, were you going to reflect on that? No, I thought Steph, was Steph go on. Sure go for it Steph so so 
we've had a chat on other thinkings before virtual i've never met you irl before i know it's exciting so hard on yourself do you think that social media is a factor what just tell us what you think about that absolutely i mean i'm only 19 and like growing up in the world of social media has just been a wild ride because yeah. you just especially kind of going back to like the early 2000s and then the 2010s and you see everyone kind of looking perfect and you only see the glamorous side of people's lives mm. and then you start comparing yourself and whoa mm. i'm not doing too great compared to everyone else <laughs> mm. and then you actually look at how they're doing and it's like maybe i'm doing a lot better than some people are mm. and it's just it's that comparison of being like am i doing okay yeah or yeah. am i not how do i how do i measure up to people it's a it's a it's an evil one too what social media does yeah. to you on the one hand it sort mm. of says you know you go girl and empowerment and stick it on your fridge and whatever and on the yeah. other it sort of says but you are fat and useless as well you've so got the spice girls going go, go like girl power and then you've got different magazines being like you should be ashamed yeah <laughs> yes exactly exactly um, someone's got a question oh sorry oh sorry Angie. you're outside of my immediate vision on the letter no, Go sorry, I was just um, uh, making a point on on that as well. Um, I was so interested to hear Georgia talking about um, when you were at school and you were the only, you thought you were the only one um, worrying about mm, going to the yeah. zoo. Because for me, um, with anxiety and um, <gasps> developing um, OCD, um, kind of during my university years and having that diagnosed and stuff, the most liberating thing was realising I wasn't the only one. Yes. And so to the point of, Exactly. being hard on yourself yeah um like my worry went from being like oh i think i'm the only one and yeah. we had the stat up on the screen saying that one mm. in a hundred um like have ocd yeah um and i used to think one percent was such a small number yeah. and now i think oh i'm not even the only one i'm actually one percent that's actually yeah, quite yeah. high when you yeah. think about it so yeah. being hard on yourself the, the most liberating thing for me was um knowing that you're not alone yeah. and knowing that you're not the, yeah. the only one and yeah. and thinking well probably everyone's got it like mm. all in their own ways mm. i think that's exactly right and to steph's point i think we don't know about every each other's inner dark overlord beavers do we so and and social media has also meant we've all all got better at masking it so mm. making mm. it so it's sort of ironic that that uh we're all it's causing us to suffer it from from it more but it's also sort of encouraging us to hide it more so yeah definitely kind of double whammy um, I might, I'm tempted to um, bring in some people who are watching at home. By the way, there's a lot of love for Moose who has now departed. The dog is Moose. Moose <laughs> belongs to Tessa. Moose made a noise. That means Moose is now removed. <laughs> so <laughs> being taken to the glue factory. Um, I, 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 I think that, that we could chat about social media for, for, forever. I, I'm interested to know, Georgie, um, all the sort of things that have happened to you in your life, difficult things, amazing things um, aside, if we just look at your work, yes. you have, by any standards, had a really extraordinary career. Can, can you, I know, look, she's really cringy, and I can feel the body just like, don't say it, don't say it, this is too awful. Can you feel proud of, of it? Um, <laughs> or is that just too excruciating? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, you always think you can be, you know, be better, be a better writer, um, improve. I'm glad people like things that I'm involved in. Um, yeah, that's nice. But uh, no, I don't think, I think I sort of like, it's, I like being an anonymous writer and um, I feel quite comfortable with that. Mm. It's weird in this, oh good, Moose is back. Um, <laughs> It's weird in the States, uh, people are a bit more respectful and that's quite unnerving. Um, and I had this very weird experience. Am I allowed to swear? I probably already have. So yeah, I think once you've said vagina, you can say yeah, what you want. Okay. Um, but I had this weird experience where very, very, I was very lucky in that something that I, I was one of the writers for um, won an award and it was terrifying. I had to wear the dress referred mm. to in this book. Mm. And um, you, you know, you get up on stage and I, there was all like my heroes, like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and Amy Schumer in the 
audience and my, I was my face was shaking I didn't know that could happen <laughs> um, and but there was this moment where this someone amazing handed me this very shiny pointy thing and I was like wow and I and then you sort of walk through the curtain to the back and there's what you don't realize is there's this huge, much bigger room behind the curtain of these awards things full of photographers and journalists like 10,000 people taking photos and I sort of was handed this thing and for 10 seconds I was like oh my goodness and then as I walked through I stood too near one of the actors mm. and as one a thousand photographers shouted get the fuck out of the way you're ruining the fucking photo <laughs> so, so there was that moment where I was for 10 minutes I was for 10 seconds I was proud and then I was brought straight back down to yes me. not you somebody yes, else today <laughs> um Kerry um would you mind just passing to Kerry the thing and and how comedies change over my lifetime I suppose because yeah. if I think about so I'm growing up in the sort of 70s early 80s and comedy is a lot about cruelty yeah it, you know, it's about mm. the Irish or it's about black people or it's about you know it's it's, a, mm. it's about picking on somebody and and in a sense I wonder if you think you've kind of won because it's a lot more about anxiety these days than yeah than cruelty and does that does that seem to you like a in the end I don't know how much comedy you think there'd be these days without anxiety because it's yeah. so much so important isn't it in the in the mix of what makes us laugh mm. I think laugh it really out. is yeah particularly in with stand-ups you know so much of a stand-ups set is about their attitude or their issues um and I think it's very interesting the difference between humor in Britain and humor in America in that you know we've sort of gloried in our incompetence you know we love whether it's Basil Fawlty or um Ricky Gervais in the office we love laughing at how crap we are whereas the Americans have always been much more aspirational mm. and um but it's also interesting that it is still so sexist over here you know I think America has proved itself to be horrifically racist and sexist in the last five years and mm. indeed before but they're ahead of us in terms of women in comedy because right from the beginning they've had Lucille Ball and they've had Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda and Roseanne and Ellen and they've always had women in the leads and we've just haven't got that history it's always been men in the leads women are the nags or slags they do the setup lines and you know I think that's that's why I do most of my work in the states because if you want to write fully rounded female characters it has to be there you know one of our most popular sitcoms here is a man in a dress yeah and I just would love it if it was a woman in a dress yeah um, yeah but and so would Moose. Moose agrees <laughs> absolutely yeah couldn't it couldn't be true do you, why, why do you think that is I don't know we're strange aren't we British? Yeah. I mean it's very Oxbridge it started off very Oxbridge and male I think it's improving but that you know we all know from really upsetting recent events in the news that if there's a if women have a problem it's up to women to solve it mm. so there are more writer performers you know Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Sharon Horgan, uh, Miranda, all Michaela Cole they weren't being written the part so they then wrote themselves incredible parts now that comes that's great but it comes from a place of inequality mm. but how much richer are we all for those incredible shows that yeah they wrote yeah. so it's improving purely because women are doing everything in their power to make it improve but until we till everyone does something in their power we are still going to turn on the telly and see white men in comedies yeah Tommy. yes um hi hi <laughs> um it's it's funny because they were talking about anxiety because i've actually been really anxious all morning about whether or not I was going to say something today, I was like, oh, you have to oh. say something. Not least because Succession is my absolute favorite TV show of all time. Good. But also I'm an actress and I'm thinking, do I, do I need to speak? Do I not speak? And, but when you mentioned the underrepresentation, mm. that obviously is a, is a big thing when you're a, a black person and a yeah. woman. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, so much of your success as a creative in any part of it is hinges on other people's decisions yeah and 
you kind of the you you get rejected and you think okay i'm gonna do it again i'm gonna do it again i'm gonna keep going um and it's 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 disheartening mm. if that makes sense yeah because <sighs> sorry it's i'm getting okay. <laughs> sorry it's, it's right you're good it is really disheartening because people will be telling you no you're doing really well this is really good mm. and you kind of you believe them you're like this is genuine but at the same time my back is really up against it because mm. you're mm. being rejected on a constant mm. near constant basis yeah. or m more than you aren't being rejected if that makes sense yeah um and my my anxiety tends to make me overcompensate by speaking a bit too much and oversharing yeah. a bit too much and then backtracking and all yeah. of this um but I wanted to to know how do you kind of convince yourself that you're great anyway if that makes <laughs> sense well I don't but um <laughs> but I think what's what is clear is that the most exciting things you know books and things to read and watch are authentic voices and certainly in the states that is recognized people want authentic personal stories and and you know people like Michaela Cole are changing things hopefully more people will come through it's really interesting because I'm writing something at the moment in the states that is set in the 17th century where obviously you know slavery was still a thing and we were we I'm writing it with um lots of people of color and we we had this we were having this conversation that I don't know if you've heard of the Bechdel test which is yeah, yeah so women mustn't just talk about men but so one of the my lovely writers I'm working with who's biracial who's called Adam County so I now want to call it the county test he's he said that the people of color in this thing we're writing can't just be talking about the white people even though they've got good reason to because they're so awful mm. like they need you know so there needs to be a county test as well where the black people or people of color don't just talk about white people or about racism because there's whole yeah. other things for them and i think that's you know i just hope that all these different diverse voices are heard because i think those we've heard you know i remember when i um tried to take a comedy idea to uh, every single channel over here has said we've already got something with women in mm. <laughs> and i suggested something to the bbc that had women in it and they said no we've already got something with women and at the time they had and i'm nothing against either of these shows but they had um uh the jack whitehall show when he was a teacher and the david williams show when he was a teacher so that was two shows with white yeah. middle-class men being teachers who fancied female teachers who didn't really fancy them back I mean they were identical mm. scenarios and yet that didn't feel too much yeah. so it's interesting you know I kind of say okay we've heard we've heard they're great but we've heard those let's hear some different There's something different now yeah um thanks so much thank you Tomily excellent question and um, there's a fun um exercise in the chat with everybody saying names of brilliant female comedians i went last night to the soho mm. theater and watched sarah baron who was very funny um and she is american and her set opens with the thing of you've not whooped enough i'm american i mean you, you need to be american and with the whooping level otherwise <laughs> yeah. don't be british otherwise i'll be sad um uh, i'm going to bring in um from home if i can joe billington who's asked what i think is a really good question um Mel Gidroch has just said, I think comedy is about release, which is why anxiety yes, is a great yes. territory for sort of producing comedy. So yes, you need to put it somewhere true, outside yeah. of you. Yeah. Um, but if we can find Joe Billington, that would be great. Oh, I don't, maybe, maybe they're not able to come in. I'll, I'll, I'll read what Joe said. Um, An increased need for control is a common anxiety response, e.g. COVID and toilet roll hoarding. So I wonder <laughs> how much writing is about bringing a level of control to what might feel like an out of control world. I think that's an excellent point. I think that it definitely is a way of organizing thoughts and mm. expressing difficult feelings because mm. you can sort of put them on someone else. Mm. So, um, yeah, a lot of my weirdness comes out in Roman Roy. 
Um, Thank you for him. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I think he's spot on. Yeah, it's um, he, she, Joe. Joe, I'm not sure. Joe is spot on. Uh, it's a really good way of... Female, she says. It's a she. <laughs> uh, it's a really good way of organising thoughts and sort of expressing yourself and, mm. and sort of... And kind of analysing... It's very difficult, isn't it, to be objective about yourself, but I think you can kind of analyse and understand mm. things when you sort of um, give them to another kind of character and see where that takes you. The, 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 I'm going to talk about succession now because I can't not. Okay. Not. Um, and we had a thinking a few weeks ago, um, and Frank Cottrell Boyce came, and we were and, and Daisy Goodwin, we and the, the kind of question we were grappling with because we're a newsroom, you we know, we're meant to be journalists, um, was whether drama is better at news than journalism now, oh. and sort of storytelling, yeah. thinking through you know ethics and stuff like that. Um, and I know obviously succession is not a, it's not about news. Um, it's not a new show. It's mm. completely a, a drama. Obviously, there's, there's you know strong Murdochian element to it. Um, I wonder what no you. Comment. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I wonder what you think about that. About sort of this because it's because Succession is absolutely making points about the yes. real world, isn't well, it? Yeah, it is about well, media, isn't it? A lot mm. of it. Um, I think that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, it's. I mean, the media's in a very strange place, isn't it, mm. after the last few years? And I think succession is a great way of of um, showing where the power comes and where the influence comes mm. and, and how that ends up on our pages and on our screens. And, um, you know, what's scary is that what's meant to be fiction keeps coming true. So, for example, before succession I was working on Veep, which mm. was mm -hmm. a bit like think of it, but about um, yeah. American politics, and so many things we wrote then and and on the thick of it, in fact, then would happen, mm. and we um, we had to go around the White House at one point, and everyone there was saying, "Oh, it's it, it, it's so accurate," and you were thinking, "Oh my God, I was hoping it was a wildly exaggerated <laughs> yeah, yes. caricature." That's disappointing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> And, you know, I mean, Trump did a lot of bad things and it's not the worst thing he did, but he put an, an end to Veep because on Veep we had a, a president who was awful, uh, sort of venal, ruthless, selfish, lying monster, but <laughs> she had a sense of shame and... Yeah. Uh, and she was kind of punished when she did bad things. And suddenly overnight, that seemed twee and old fashioned. Also, the fact that there was a woman president seemed utterly ridiculous yeah. suddenly. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, the, the truth kind of killed off. It was, mm. it was more ridiculous and uh, insane than anything we could come up with. You did, get, you did meet Michelle Obama, though, didn't you? I did. Tell yes. us about that. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, yeah, we had to do a sort of sketch with... This was when Obama was... Those days when Obama was president. Uh. <sighs> um, and Joe Biden was vice president. We had to do this kind of silly sketch with Joe Biden and our fictional vice president. And so we had to go to the White House and it was really um, fun and amazing. And Michelle was so funny and had great comedic timing and, <sighs> yeah... She's she cool. really is all of the things, isn't She's she? All of the things, yeah. It's so depressing and, and wonderful. Tessie, I think you wanted to. I don't know where the mic's gone. Right. Would you mind passing it wrong? Cheers, Marion. Sorry. I don't know if we'll be able to. If you're watching at home, Tessa's on the floor with the dog. So imagine <laughs> that scene. I was, thinking, I, was, I was just thinking about that comment you made about you only remember once and then you remember the remembering. Yes. And I was thinking about um, the. Therapy. Yeah. And the narrative, how much of that is a true narrative? How much of it is a narrative you're creating? Because that's sort of either you're slightly performing for your therapist or you're trying to, to you're trying to re, you know, be slightly revisionist about your past or whether actually you're just remembering the remembering and it's never really an authentic narrative. Whoa. Sorry. That's a good <laughs> question. Um, I think. I think the sort of retelling helps, you know, we are all all kind of 
writing our own memoirs, aren't we? We're kind of honing our memories and, and kind of trying to make them make sense and make sense of our past. So I think we're, I mean, I, I hope we're all trying to be sort of authentic and truthful in that. Um, I don't think it helps if you're not being truthful. So I, I think, I think, um, I think the retelling of it is helpful. I think it, it gives you perspective and, and a deeper understanding. Yeah, I would say that's an optimistic. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think I would recommend it. I was very, very bar humbug about therapy for years. I thought it was stuff and nonsense and what a load of American and then I had it and it was really amazing. <laughs> and I changed my position on that. Um, um, my, my, I have, do have a therapist and she, I don't know if she's the very best person I could have or the very worst person I could have, but basically if I say a joke, she acts as though I haven't spoken. <laughs> and I can't tell if that's great. That or, must be really discombobulating. It is, it's, but just, you know, if I say something stupid, she's just like, I, def I definitely was conscious when I was having therapy that I wanted to be the best at thera therapy. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be the, fa like the favourite one that yeah, was like exactly. doing the good stuff and yeah. there was a bit of that for sure. Yeah. Pretty sure I nailed it, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's some, uh, they're, they're all singing along in the chat between themselves to Victoria Woods songs now, so we've lost oh, them. Good. <laughs> we can say what we want, they've, they've gone. Oh, there's great. Sort of talk of um, beating people on the bottom of the woman's yes. retreat. And, Classic line. And some mention of acorn antiques, which of oh course God. must, yeah. you know, I have been accused in a thinking before when I had a strong cocktail. It was a cocktail making thinking. I wasn't just drinking it my desk. <laughs> and and um, it was serving Negronis out of a jug. I was accused of being very two soups in my vibe. So <laughs> I feel happy about that. There you go, two soups. They're all typing it, two soups, two soups. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, before we go, so succession is coming on Monday. Hurrah, yes. I think. The 17th, whenever that is. Monday, is it right? No, oh, that's Sunday. Sunday. <gasps> Monday. Okay, UK Monday. Okay, oh, UK Monday. Monday. Oh, we have to God. wait. Um, there are two lines from the previous two series that have become p part of uh, the family chat. One is what's popping Malala Roy, and one is I'm shit fucking Roy, which is you know when you have to queue. Um, and I wonder in the sort of putting together of series. So I know you won't give us any spoilers, but. How are we? Is there going to be a four and will we love it? And tell us spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely going to be a four, yes. yes! Um, yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to love it. Um, and you know, I'm I will be killed if I say anything that happens, but I am a big champion of the Rome and Jerry romance, yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm always striving to, uh, make sure that that has plenty of space. As a writer, this is a, probably a dental issue, as a writer, are you on set while they're filming or do you, yes. you're there and it's sort of live and they riff on it and yes, stuff? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And the, uh, I don't know if I can be this rude, but um, they're all brilliant. The actors are just incredible and I don't know how much time I've got to tell you about how brilliant they are. Four mins. Four mins, okay, super quickly then. <laughs> um, so one of the episodes I wrote was the Thanksgiving episode, which I um, oh. hope you agree was a delight, just to see them in their pullovers. Yeah, Logan's casual. thick cashmere, cable casual. Mm -hmm. And then Tom's very disturbing turtleneck that made me go, oh, every time he walked towards <laughs> me. Um, but then I wrote the episode where they're in the safe room, and I wrote that scene where oh, that was Tom brilliant. pelts Greg with water bottles. And yeah. at the time, I thought, oh, I hope this is funny. Um, but then Matthew McFadden played it with such emotion that yeah. it became this incredibly yeah. moving scene. So that was just, I think as a writer, you always think, I hope those bloody meat puppets say their lines how I <laughs> want them to. And then there are times when they bring a whole different thing that you'd never thought of, and then that's wonderful. Um, but they also <laughs> do... Meat puppets, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, that... Mel, that's how I think of you. Um, but they also do uh, improvise as well, and we can kind of come up with lines mm. on the spot, and that's really fun to do. But Kieran Colkian is just the king of improvising. We were... When there was that wedding episode, 
Oh. We were writing that scene. We've all been there when you're talking to someone and then you want to move away and you don't quite know what your exit line should <laughs> yeah. be. So we were all kind of standing around thinking and I was saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then Kieran just said, I know, I'll say, well, these hands aren't going to fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, say, say that. that. I mean, I've, I've spent weeks coming up with things, but yeah, sure, say the thing you just came up with on the spot. That's, that's good. That's better. Yeah. yeah. You've got to be prepared to go there, I think, haven't you? There's sort of, sort of layers of depravity. Yeah. Um, it's been such a joy to have you. Thank you so, so much. And thank you for facing your terrible I know. fear. <laughs> not as awful as I thought it was going to be. Oh, so well done, you. everyone. What <laughs> amazing feedback. We'll put it on our LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> not as awful as we thought. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, please do buy the book. Um, if you're a Tortoise member, come forward. George has kindly said she'll sign one if you'd like to take one with you. Um, and it's been brilliant. Um, we can't wait. Have a brilliant... It's tonight, the launch? Tonight, yes. <gasps> So go home, frock um, on, uncomfortable frocks. shoes, yeah. and then nervously standing around yeah. wishing it was over. Looking for canapes. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. amazing. Use the line. Yeah, the hands yeah. aren't going to fuck themselves. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. And enjoy you, uh, Succession, everybody, and buy the book, and have a lovely weekend. We are back on Monday evening with former Children's Laureate Michael Morpurgo. Come in, bring your kids, have a lovely time, and enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>